and go in. Hello, beautiful friends, and welcome to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. People sometimes will ask me which podcasts I enjoy. Well, I enjoy listening to history podcasts and also A Healthy Curiosity with Brody Welch. She is joining us today. The reason why I love this podcast is I'll listen to it while exercising, maybe going for a walk in the morning. And one of the central themes that comes through is it's about Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, yoga. These are kind of the tools that are used to really respect and enhance one's own ability to honor the yin or engage in self-care, which is something of a challenge for me. And we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. So thank you so much for coming on to talk with us, Brody. I am honored to be with you, Andrew, and really excited to have this conversation. So how have you been in the last few months? Wow. Um, the, given, given everything that's been going on, I've, I've been holding up, I, I think, pretty well. And I've also been giving myself the freedom to adapt to the fact that with things like the election and COVID and really just so much stress and uncertainty in, in the mental environment, it seems like even just my normal workload of, of patients is about 30 to 40% more difficult doing it in a mask, doing, you know, like not being able to read people's facial expression and also holding space for so much of this mental emotional pain that might be there in addition to just the, the usual shoulder pain, back pain, um, sleep problems, whatever it is like that, um, that it seems like everyone has needed a little bit more space to, to unpack the, the stresses of the world and denied our usual outlets. So I've realized that I get home from clinic days more exhausted and more depleted than I had been. Mm. And I responded to that by actually changing my schedule so that I could, so I used to, to stop at um, a yoga studio or a gym on my way home as a transition space between my, my, my clinic day and then being uh, with my family. And so recognizing that like, oh yeah, actually, if I, if I give myself an extra half hour in the morning, I can do a longer workout and not have to shortchange meditation and really be able to show up for my patients with, uh, with the best of me and, and then be able to kind of leave it all on the field, so to speak, and, and, then, and then get home. So it's, it's uh, so things like that, that I've, I've been recognizing that, that it is a more challenging time in a lot of ways. And, and then the, the days that I'm not in clinic, I'm doing the podcast and I'm doing my coaching practice. And, um, and I've, I've really gotten into creating um, that giving myself a little bit more permission to do less, which is um, if, <laughs> for listeners of my show will know that this is a common theme for me is that, mm -hmm. that working myself really hard and deriving a lot of sense of self from how much I get done and, uh, is is so it's so in the culture and mm -hmm. I I personally buy into it I bite that hook of yang addiction a lot and so really being able to reckon with the fact that it is actually okay to to not be in a perpetual state of deficit of perpetually giving out more energy than I'm able to put back and so it's been really um, it's been really kind of a challenge put forth by the pandemic to really have me be in greater alignment with myself and, it, and, and my capacity. And I feel like that actually is helping me deliver my message from a stronger, more authentic platform. Well, I really appreciate that. And one of the reasons why your message resonated so much is there are a lot of people in health and wellness who will say, um, well, you need to wake up at four or six o'clock or something. And then there are all of these things you're supposed to do and meditate this or that. And um, a lot of them, a lot of these people are dumb as a rock and they were, they're incapable of pushing themselves toward anything. And knowing that you know, <laughs> you're very smart, very capable, have pushed yourself to the limit and unfortunately learned these lessons the hard way that was what resonated with me because 
you know, when somebody's just a slug and is telling you it's okay to relax a little bit, it's quite a different message than when somebody has the capacity for both and is intentionally engaging in really honoring that yin space. Thank you. I, and, and that, and that really is like, as if we think about people's tendencies, right. For the, for the, the non-Chinese medicine folks who might be listening, right. This, that the, that someone who is more inclined towards speed and productivity and outward, outward going energy that, that, that person might naturally be more young and there, it, it might, like that person is going to have to be, is going to have to work at the self care at, at the putting back, versus uh, kind of like the type A versus type B, the, the someone who's more naturally comfortable with lying around, um, you know, the and and just just being and enjoying. Mm-hmm. Um, this person uh, that that they're they're constitutionally different, and so yeah, I, I and I work with a lot of a lot of type A overachievers, perfectionists, and and people who have really you, you know who often like some. Of that may be who we naturally are, but some of it might mm-hmm. be a survival strategy that we've picked up along the way in order to stay safe in the world. And that is kind of like where, where um, helping, helping patients really see what it is they're buying into that is preventing them from, from being able to take care of themselves is, is something of a, of a personal mission of mine. So, so many times I, I think that women especially are are socialized to to take care of everyone else's needs before their own but that that then again those of us who are in the medical community that it's the same sort of ethos right like that it's it's better to to overextend and treat that you know treat the extra people be more available and that that is you know the sort of like selfless giving um physician or or practitioner is lauded and the person who recognizes that they have limits that we're not machines and that our 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 whole lives are subject to the the fluctuation and the pulsation of yin and yang and that there needs to be a balance between the two um that that is that something that that we need to recognize and honor and look at what gets in the way of us being able to naturally be in those rhythms because really that that is that's sort of central to uh, to health is not pushing ourselves and and to allowing ourselves to to be and grow at at a rate that is organic and sustainable that's wonderful what would you say besides this is another story that people buy into that ends up really giving them half of a life? <laughs> oh, so many. Um, there's, well, really, I think that there's there's an, a notion of like who we think we need to be in the world uh, in order to stay safe. Like that's sort of a primary one, and that and there there can be. I mean, we could even break those down elementally, you know, that from mm-hmm. from a Chinese medicine perspective. But the the idea that that um, that we got a message early on in life that if we did not please our caregivers or if we did if or if we did not we did what we needed to do to get through whatever adversity presented itself early on and and to to figure out a way of of making it go in the world and so it's kind of like if we think about it, 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 that that's that's like a learned pattern it's a habit it's a sense of self that is not the fullness of who we are it's just one slice of it that we we've developed that muscle we we've leaned into it and so then it becomes who we think we need to be and then therefore like a lot of the stress that we experience comes from when that survival strategy is challenged and so that survival strategy could be something like i you know a, an underlying limiting belief that uh, I need to take care of everyone else before myself, um, or like I need to I, I need to do it all myself. It needs to look perfect, or I'm a total imposter. Um, I need to I, that my that that what I do for others is more important than uh, you know that activity is more important than rest. Uh, that productivity is more important than filling up the well. That my body exists to prop up my head. Uh, you know, like there there can be all sorts of versions of this that that get really specific um but i think just ultimately like recognizing that we're in this we're in a, a system of that that 
that um, of, well, capitalism, <laughs> mm-hmm. capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, all of these forces that are at work to uh, to to try to shape us into um, into essentially like I don't know the forty hour work week, for example, or just or what what people have to do in order to to earn money. This idea that that we have to move faster and work harder and chain ourselves to our, our workstations and, and that this will make us more productive. This is all a product of this cultural emphasis on yang and and not on yin. And so so recognizing like we all know that we can't be productive if we're short sleep three nights in a row. Like that in, in nature, it's not like day, 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 night, day, day, right? Like wait, there's mm-hmm. this balance, there's a pulsation. And so recognizing that that we all know that we're going to be more productive if we can take a break, if we can, if we can get up and move our bodies, that we will fend off. Uh, you know, we know that stagnation leads to pain, and too much sitting or too much repetitive movement is is going to create a problem. But telling ourselves, like, no, you actually have the right to stop and take care of yourself, and that that's not optional. It's not a luxury that you have to earn. It's something that's absolutely essential preventative care, and. You don't have to wait until something breaks. You don't have to wait till you get that scary diagnosis, the autoimmune disease, the cancer, the uh, the cardiovascular disease, or what you know, the, all the all the metabolic diseases of aging. That we can we can focus on prevention, and that that's actually smart. <laughs> it's like it's not what's reinforced, right? That that it's not how our medical system is set up. It's you know, doctors aren't aren't paid to spend time educating their patients, and so it, it's a uh, you know that that everything's like problem focused rather than preventative and and wellness focused. And so, really, it takes a lot of strength of character and a lot of strategy to figure out how can I make my life such that I am honoring, treating myself with respect, embodying self-respect through my daily actions, these essential habits that we need in order to, to thrive and to stay well. I love how you use the word strength of character and strategy, uh, which are words in English I tend to think of as uh, like a lot of very masculine, like business strategy books, like Jack Welch will use that, but you're using that to kind of shine light on the feminine. It's, uh, it's something that's, that I find really interesting. It's one of the reasons why I really love listening to you because of that. Um, as whenever you're talking, I always reflect immediately on my schedule, like, Oh God, because as much as I am thinking that I'm doing things efficiently by trying to introduce yin elements into life, ultimately a lot of times it is enough to prop up my head still for the idea of uh, productivity as opposed to um, maybe productivity being that which helps you nourish yin. It's like it, it doesn't come back full circle. So yeah, I think it's interesting how you balance both the concepts and then words that way. Well, thanks. I, and, and, and I actually, both of those things, I, um, I, I, both of those things are key, right? That we need, first of all, we need to know who we are and what we're about in order to make our daily actions line up with that. And that's sort of the strength of character. It's not like everyone has to be living the same life, mm-hmm. but it has to be that, but we have to make sure that the things that are truly important to us, right? If we think about the things that are, that are really important, like most people will say like, oh, the people in my life, my family, um, but the family gets the the last right the 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 dregs that are left over after what's after what people are doing at work for example um it and or they say like oh i want to be happy and rather than just go there and do the things that will truly bring them joy there's this sense of guilt if you actually prioritize that it's like who am i to to take a break and like read a book in the middle of the day or like go for a hike um something that there there is that feels really taboo and off limits to a lot of people and so so there is like the strength of character in terms of like just knowing what's important to you and therefore how you need to to set life up so that you can make sure that that at least is it, that you are that you're tithing your time and energy to that and also the strategy comes into place is because I hear from so many really smart, really motivated people about changes that they want to make in their lives. And they, you know, send them home with a little self-care piece of paper prescription about, about uh, this is, these are the stretches I want you to do, or this is how I, 
the, these are some foods I want you to incorporate into your diet, or here's the qigong I want you to do. And they'll come back a few days later, or like maybe the next month for their next check-in. And I'll ask like, how'd it go with that, that self-care? And they'll say like, oh, well, I just don't have enough willpower. Like life happens and I just kind of stopped doing it. And, and it's like many, many years ago at this point, I realized that, right, it's not like everyone kind of knows what they need to do to create health, but it's the implementation where people get stuck. And this is where it's not enough to just tell people what to do. And it's not just that, that everyone kind of knows that. We know what the essential habits are, right? managing stress, breathing, moving, nourishment, t- making time to connect with other people and to connect with ourselves. Like some version of that is going to be necessary for everyone. But in terms of making, making that happen in a world where we're continually squeezed by external expectations, this requires a knowledge of how to change habits. It, not, it requires knowing how to be strategic with ourselves in, in how we just go about structuring our day. Um, so I'm a big fan of really automating the mundane, making sure that these basics of self-care that, that we all need happen on a regular basis and that requires some it, like some some intentionality like knowing when and where these habits are going to take place or these behaviors and perhaps linking them together in a stack um, or routine because really 40 percent of our lives happen out of habit without any conscious thought at all and since we're going to be ruled by habits we you know the brain loves efficiency so like let's let's lean into that let's use that to our advantage and make sure that we're planting the right ones and then nourishing the right ones knowing how to do that and also like being able to to help people recognize what mindset they're in or what what they're buying into that is preventing them from actually implementing on this and hence this sort of discussion of the um the survival strategies the limiting beliefs the yang addiction that which is is pervasive in our culture that people have to really opt out of and and really kind of nurture their water this little seedling of a new belief internally working with a practitioner or a coach can be really helpful with that um getting peer support getting support from someone else who believes that this is possible for them is is also um or can be a really important piece of the puzzle because we are creatures of our environment more than we, and, and our environments determine our routines to a large degree and our routines determine our outcomes, right? Like that, I think that well, as much as we can change our patients' lives with herbs or with acupuncture, that I believe that the most potent levers we have over how we end up feeling are the things that we do every day. And so as practitioners or really just as conscious people wanting to be healthy and happy and self-actualized, being able to figure out how how we can make these essential habits of wellness part of our lives, what it takes to to make sure that that they have the space and time and energy that they need. Do you suggest people schedule those out first or work with the belief structures that have them um, either coming from a place of maybe self-abasement, like I don't deserve to take care of myself first, or I am so high performance that I don't need to do that the way other people would. I, I know that I've fallen into both of those traps. Ha ha, yes. <laughs> yes. The, all the, all the, the time you're like, oh, I know how to meditate. That doesn't mean you're doing it, dummy. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> Reading about herbs is different than ingesting them. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, uh, oh yeah, me too. I, I can really relate. Um, usually where I'll start with people is, is just with the low hanging fruit. So let's say I know that, that someone has clearly identified, you know, what I need to do to like, I just am sitting too much. I need to move more. So we'll start there. It's like, okay, well, how do you like to move? How, what, what is actually, how can we lead with desire and let that be at the forefront? Mm-hmm. And let's say the person likes, um, the person likes variety, right? They, they, they like doing all kinds of things. So then I might suggest like, okay, well, uh, what ideally in a given week, do you want to be moving your body? Do you want to be working out or do you just want to be moving more, right? Because then we can figure out whether we're working on creating a habit of exercise or whether that we're just introducing intermittent movement throughout their throughout their work day if they work at an office or at a desk or something like that. So we'll think about kind of like what are we aiming at? Where's the low-hanging fruit? 
what cues can we place in the environment to, to make this easier? So for example, like at the beginning of COVID, um, instead of going to my yoga studio, uh, which I was doing frequently, I busted out the free weights. I put, um, I set up a shoe tray in my living room. Like I just, one of those things that, that we collect like wet, shoes and boots on and, and put a bunch of free weights there. I put my yoga mat and a block um, in the downstairs closet so that every morning it's like now like that's easily accessible in my environment as opposed to having to find the things to, to, to do the things. Mm -hmm. we, we create, we lay down the foundation to enable the, the process that by by first creating the structure that allows us to put that into place, reducing the friction on the habits that we want and, and creating speed bumps on the things that we want to avoid. So maybe that's like, if you want to watch less TV so that you move more, well, maybe cover your TV with a cloth or like maybe organize your living room so that the couches and chairs are facing one another and not facing the television mm -hmm. or something like that so that there's a physical environment. And then usually it comes down to like what happens when we're not able to execute on our plan. And that's usually where we find what the resistance is, which it usually has something to do with, like that we just kind of get curious about it. We get to look at, well, okay, so now that we had a time and a place to do this, this behavior, why wasn't it happening? Well, what, what was I buying into so that I made the choice to either stay, you know, was, was I choosing to stay in bed? Was I choosing to uh, look at my phone and then get pulled into what other people are needing from me? Or like what, what caused my plan to fail? And then we do kind of a, a, a pre-mortem on that and, and figure out and kind of a, that from there, a lot of times start working with uh, what am I buying into so that I can see through that limiting belief and then look for evidence that something else is true, right? Like, is it really true that I need to answer email before uh, taking time for myself? It's like, well, it maybe a quick glance to make sure that nothing is burning down in my office. But after that, I really can wait an hour to do the things that I need to do to take care of myself. And so, so recognizing like, that sort of what is the value that's compelling me to to do this old behavior because because everything with everything self perpetuates because it, there's a payoff in it for us somewhere all habits are are reinforced by rewards and so if uh, so we're rewarded in a sense of like oh well i get to feel safe i get to feel like everything's under control or i get to feel like oh well you know that no, nobody nobody is waiting on me for anything like that and recognizing oh yeah that's actually not as important as me feeling connected to myself or not as important as me feeling stagnant and in pain because i haven't moved so really it's it, it's usually in the process of change that we discover that resistance to change and then we get to get curious about the resistance and then hack the resistance that's yeah that's uh that's wonderful sorry i i'm not thinking of what to say i'm really just reflecting <laughs> on what you are saying <laughs> always, it's all good no well, it, it gets me in this theta state where i'm always like okay how do i apply this to my life and you know uh, our dear friend who's listening right now start thinking about your schedule as you're listening to this i'm sure you already are because just even if you're driven by efficiency, this is the way to it. If you want to live a good life, this is the way to it. So there's no aspect of this that isn't useful. And and seeing seeing through our own um, our own resistance is really great self study, right? For people who are interested in meditation or mindfulness, that it's like we can be our own teachers all the time as as we look at how we make choices because it's it really is our values in action and when we look at what we are actually valuing by what like really in, in chinese medicine we have this this phrase yi dao chi dao mm -hmm. and so it's like where our attention goes our energy goes and that's huge right like what what that if if we get to choose what we're paying attention to that we feed what we focus on. And so being able to, to, to really live a life that is meaningful to us and that is that we can derive some satisfaction and contentment and meaning from requires that we be able to first decide what's important, right? And put our attention there and then have strategies for follow through. And that usually means 
overcoming something that some element of, of who we think we need to be. And that's, and, and it can be hard to do that in it without potentially um, help or dialogue or, you know, an outside perspective that can point out like, oh yeah, there's more to you than what you do for someone else. There's more to, to you than showing up perfectly, um, you know, and, and being able to, to then have, it, it's a curious thing to confidence, right? That having it, it, at first it does take quite a bit of courage to not lean into what has helped us be successful thus far, to, to consciously shift energy away from that very well-developed dimension of life and into something that is maybe, uh, that hasn't gotten the juice yet. It hasn't, it, it's this underdeveloped potential. And in doing that, it can feel scary and it can feel new, which is why it's important to, first of all, recognize, right, that that's, um, again, with habits and willpower, that it takes it, willpower is a muscle that wears out. And when we're trying to do something new, it can be useful to do it first thing in the morning before the stresses of life and the decision fatigue wears us down. And so a lot of times, like just thinking about like, yeah, if there is, if there's a book you want to write, if there's a, if there's a website you want to launch, if there's a, a new thing that feels scary and daunting and hard, it's going to conveniently get pushed to the back burner, most likely if you're if you're trying to schedule it like after hours or as your side gig late in the day. It's like so much more so so much more likely that you'll succeed when motivation is high, when willpower is high, and when energy is high. So doing the hard thing first is um, is something that I I really tend to recommend to people. And then also noticing right that as we as we study ourselves. In yoga and qigong, right? That's it's about noticing and observing, and so noticing what happens to you physically, and it, and sort of metaphysically at the same time, when you are true to your values. Like, how good does it feel to get up and do the hard thing? It's like that necessarily, I think, feeds back on your sense of capability and confidence, which then makes that personal evolution process that much easier, right? That in of itself is rewarding and can keep us going. It also might make it easier to take that break if you've already clicked, you know, you've checked off having done something um, that you anticipated doing. It's like an agreement with yourself. If that's exercise or self-care, if you, if you keep an agreement with yourself, at least personally, that's how I find I strengthen my own confidence. As I say, I'm going to do something and I do it. It doesn't matter if anybody's watching because my subconscious is watching. And even just being able to say, okay, I'm going to do this in the morning and I get up and do whatever it is, then there's already a sense of congruency that I don't feel like I'm losing that congruency and then that needs to be made up for through some external achievement exactly yes that that is that is precisely what i'm alluding to there's also a flip side that i'd like to bring up and that yeah. is that um that a lot of times we can fall into the thinking error uh, especially those of us who want, who have have big goals and dreams and aspirations and are are driven to achieve, is that we keep moving the goalposts on ourselves. So whereas, like you might feel like, ah, well, I did the hard thing today, and I, I can feel I can feel good about that, and there's this subconscious. Uh, accounting for the fact that we did that, that can add to our confidence. The flip side of that is like, okay, well, what if you oversleep? <laughs> or what if you get sucked into a past pattern mm -hmm. and you and you don't do the thing that you're intending? It can be really easy for that to engender the what the hell effect um, and just make it like so that you just give up. And that can be ultimately undermining because you you jump to the conclusion like, see, I tried this thing, I tried doing the new thing, I failed. I am a failure. This can never change. And, and then it's easy to, to kind of have that derail any attempt at progress. And so with my clients, I, I, uh, I recognize and I help them recognize that perfection is not the metric here. It's about progress. It's about, you know, the fact that you trying to do the new thing, the, the, the version of you that is doing that is lapping the version of you that is not doing that, right? It's still going to be a million times better than if you weren't trying. And so really kind of um, 
aiming for the proverbial B minus, right? Of aiming for for that. <laughs> it's a phrase we kicked around in yoga health coaching circles, uh, right? Just getting over the I've I've got to be perfect or it's not use or, or it's not useful. That this idea that that you know shooting for an eighty percent. So if you're trying to do something every day and you're hitting it four days out of seven that's a passing grade, right? Like that counts. And that is the, the value of compound habits, right? The things that we do over and over again, carve a deeper and deeper groove. And it's akin to that, those few degrees uh, of on the compass where we change direction from like North to Northwest. And we multiply that out over time and we're in a very different place than we would have ended up if we hadn't made those changes. And so really getting over the black and white thinking or the all or nothing, that kind of thing is super important in order to 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 keep that confidence and sense that change is possible when you're not batting a thousand hmm. you know you mentioned earlier about um, the habits in the past or the way of being in the past that brought success and reflecting on that I realized that that was something that I'd really modeled from my mother and um, and also the self-care habits along with that or lack thereof. So it's kind of interesting because we will kind of magnetize ourselves to uh, a parent or a stronger example, especially growing up. But then, yeah, sometimes that can be a double-edged sword and oftentimes or could be um, antiquated in some sense based on Abs- time. Absolutely right. Um, if there's, if you grew up in, um, yes, yeah, so f- yes to the fact that we we get all sorts of messages about how we, we how we can and should care for ourselves from our from our parents, right, from our early life caregivers, but also um, you know the, some of these survival strategies that get stuck because of early childhood trauma or just early life experience that it, that if you made it through your childhood by getting quiet and hiding, then the idea of like putting yourself out there on social media might be utterly terrifying, right? And, yeah. and recognizing that, that looking at, at that really taking the time to work on ourselves, right? Whether that's in therapy or, or in coaching or, or practices that where we can sort of bring ourselves up to speed that, 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 strategy that was once useful um, and once maybe served us and had a place is, is no longer, it's, it's no longer helping, right? The same things, same habits that helped us survive are not the ones that will help us thrive. And similarly, it's like, if you, if you're kind of like, oh, well, I've gotten by this far on, you know, like coffee to speed up and alcohol to slow down, you know, then uh, why do I need to ever change this behavior? And then it's like, well, <laughs> then suddenly you know, multiply that 20 years in the future and, and you might realize that, that you want some different strategies for meeting those ends. And so really it's like the earlier we can do this and, and really tend. And again, like who's going to think like, as we think about um, our, our, goals for ourselves and our lives that like doing that hidden yin work of of addressing what has gone on in the past so that we can show up more fully in the present it's kind of like getting your your ducts cleaned or like you know getting your house re-insulated it's like all this expensive hard work that nobody really sees except it pays off in the end, you know, like it pays, pays for itself over and over again, but doing it does not feel particularly um, sexy or um, obvious. <laughs> it's like all of this, um, which, which I think is a lot of things that, that, that um, it's the most important thing we can do really so that we can show up for the people in our life with presence and not from, you know, making the people in our present pay for the mistakes of the way people treated us in the past. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, since um, since I started listening to your podcast, that was one of the aspects of it coming to fruition was that I do take more time now for really taking yin space, not uh, doing qigong to warm up my dantian so I can do something. It's just for its own sake. That's been a mental shift. But the work that I do now, it seems to be more intentional. And along with that, there's a lot that I'm just not doing. And that which I'm not doing, 
the extra energy that I have or that increased focus for the things that I am deciding to do, there's a lot more return in terms of the cost benefit analysis of that um, in all aspects of life, how enriching it is, how financially profitable, how uh, useful it is for other people, all of that is increased. So if, yeah. That's, yeah, that, that is, I think, I think that's a natural result, right? That we, our energy becomes more potent when it is honed and focused, right? We become the, you know, the fire hose versus the lawn sprinkler going everywhere with, with energy. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciate that, that your shift to, yeah, valuing your Qigong for, for its own sake, not as a means to an end, like just that, that I've noticed that too, with, with my yoga practice, it's like on the days when I'm like, oh, well, I need to, um, I, my, you know, I'm going to do this for 45 to 60 minutes because this is part of, you know, my building my strength and flexibility and blah, blah, blah for the future. And, blah, and, but versus just like, how does my body want to move? Like this idea of like, in that Marie Oliver poem, like what is, you know, letting the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Mm. And just that idea of like, yeah, what does the animal part of me want right now? Because it, that there's this dimension of our being that is, uh, our, that is in our physicality that's also really smart <laughs> and so and just listening to it like letting it take the lead can sometimes be um informative and then yeah it's yes to subtraction and clearing out the noise from life letting go of where you know what was what was maybe a distraction or or even just like thinking about the 80 20 rule like what was maybe like marginally useful in your life but not really moving the needle on on what your goals are personally and professionally. So that idea of letting go of the non-essential leaves more for what is. There's an audio book I picked up recently, a very short one, and it's uh, a monk describing how monks clean, clean the house, clean the temple, whatever. And uh, yeah, I, I found that really useful because I am somebody who uh, my modeling or growing up was my mom associated house cleaning with being a perfect 1950s housewife. And part of her rebellion against that entire paradigm, there were positive aspects of that that went out with the bathwater. And so that was something that I also felt like, well, uh, housework isn't as important as being very high performance and very useful at your job. So that was kind of, uh, for me anyway, it was useful to kind of look at that as a, an aspect of self-cultivation or as a spiritual practice, not as something that is, um, you know, too mundane or is associated with uh, perfectionism or just kind of reframing my concepts around that. It was very useful. So much is like, it's not the what, but the why, you mm -hmm. know, so that thinking about, yeah, housework for it, that you don't have to buy into having a perfect home or what, you know, being, being the perfect 1950s housewife or whatever. It can simply be that like mopping the floor to mop the floor and letting that be a meditation or letting that be like just something that, that is going to enable a sense of serenity for you to, to do your life with. and and. It, that recognizing that that yeah that's part of that the the spaces that we inhabit um, have an effect on us and and mm -hmm. being able to to recognize like um, I don't know I I I think I think about my need for order increases when anxiety increases mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like so um, so asking myself like oh does this really need to be cleaned or am I trying to manage an internal you know like am I trying to control the uncontrollable and it's coming out by um, by needing my kitchen to be spotless before I move on mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway but yes and all of that can be can be a way that uh, a way to study our motivations or wh what we're valuing can you talk a little bit more about environmental health and how that would affect you and vice versa? Sure. I mean, I think that there's, so talked a little bit earlier about how our environment cues us all the time, right? Based on what's in it. Uh, we're, we're more likely to eat the thing that we see first, right? And so just simple things that, that ways that, that the things around us, actually 
cue our behavior subconsciously. Also the people that are around us, right? That we, we want to fit into, like we're creatures of norms, right? And in, in uh, early humans would have died if we were kicked out of the tribe. And so we want to, generally speaking, fit in. And so this so other people kind of determine our choices, not through like pressuring us or, or being um, abusive or bullies or anything like that, but just by what they're doing. So just if you live with a partner or in a family, it's like if one partner gains weight, the, the other is 37% more likely to become obese as well. You know, so this idea of just, just because of what's in the environment and just what we're seeing and what, what becomes normalized, um, the kind of environment that we're in mentally, right? The, the, the thought forms and beliefs and conversations that we routinely expose ourselves to are things that we need to digest and process and detoxify from, you know, so whether or not you're tuning into this podcast or something that is going to, or like the, the morning news, for example, it's going to put you in a very different space about what you're paying attention to, what you're thinking about, um, you know, emotionally, whether or not it hooks you in a way that is, uh, that is angering or frustrating versus empowering that, that these are, these are things that like, that, our, our self is this very porous thing, right? Not just in terms of like our, our human biofield being influenced by the environmental toxins or, that are around us and the EMFs that are around us or the, the, the energy of the human beings that we're encountering, uh, but that really everything that we're exposed to has to be run through our systems. And, you know, in Chinese medicine that, that we think about the, the causes of disease being uh, that, you know, that lifestyle and diet stuff that how we're living our lives, the things that the things that happen to us, and how we interpret them, right? That that whether or not we can digest our life experience in a way that serves us, or in a way that creates dampness, lingering, turbid crap that is hanging out in our systems. It's like we can make choices that that allow for that support the positive digestion of our life experience. And that requires time and space to digest what's coming at us. And it requires conscious choice about whose energy we want to be around, what conversations we want to tune into and what we want, um, you know, what kind of, what kind of chemicals we're using in our home. It's just, uh, all of that is going to have an impact uh, physiologically, psychologically, um, and even spiritually. I've been reading studies about the, volatiliome and uh, aerobiome how people are putting off scent i mean in addition to well i should say in conjunction with the emotions come hormones and fragrances and different bacteria that are on those fragrances so anger will cultivate different bugs <laughs> that are floating around that you're breathing than kindness or happiness will having a yard that is sprayed with DDT or <laughs> sprayed with uh, Roundup or whatever poisons are popular this decade, that gets into your microbiome and can be measured pretty quickly. Even with nursing mothers, it's, it's something that, uh, as you said, we're just so porous. So cultivating a life around us you know, starts within and then as it goes out to our circle of friends and family, as it goes out into our physical environment, those are all various manifestations of the same self-care. Absolutely, yeah, and and really, uh, there's I've I've done I've done many episodes on environmental toxicity and like mm -hmm. what the the effects that that does to us, and and really like that that comes into my conversations with patients about in that it's like, okay, well, your diet might be pristine, but what are you putting on your body? <laughs> and what are you, you know, like, is your, is your toothpaste destroying your oral microbiome is, you know, are, are you dousing yourself with, um, with phthalates and, you know, in the form of fragrances and, and things that are artificial scent that, um, that is it, that, is going to be a, like not only a cancer trigger potentially, but just a, that our, our ability to to detoxify, our ability to let go, and and um, and even I think I mean what I notice is just like I breathe differently. Like my something like my body knows this does not belong. This is this is a chemical I does not want in. And just as we know, the importance of breath is um, is primary in terms of affecting what what's going to go on in the nervous system 
As a result of the last six months, the added pressure, the intensifier that the election year with COVID, <laughs> everything else, uh, the national panic that's happened. Do you find insulating yourself from that and strengthening yourself in that environment has changed pretty significantly compared to last year or the year before? And what lessons has that brought that were different from before? It's a good question. It's, um, I, is I, I don't feel particularly insulated from it. Um, you know, that it, there is with, with patients, I had a lot of conversations about, um, powerlessness, you know, that something that, uh, that politically, for example, that, um, people, people often felt like it was, um, you know, that, the relationship with the world at large is a relationship. It's just not one, it's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship where we can influence what happens directly by flipping the script. It's something that we have a little less direct agency over, but we still do have some. And just, and so lots of conversations with people about like, so you still have emotions that you have to digest in response to the world at large. And how it and and really like a lot of times like so there that's like step one is recognizing that it is having an effect on you and tending to whatever that's bringing up um and for for a lot of people it had to do with just basic things like safety um you know the racism and xenophobia and things like that um that that were bringing up people's uh you know very real like am i safe questions and uh, in in ways that were new in ways that that they hadn't felt like wow I, i've never thought about like my my neighbors you know being potentially threats you know th those kinds of things so really unpacking with people like what um that taking it seriously that this is a factor it is like a toxin in the environment that we have to to filter out or reckon with or deal with in some way and then after that sort of internal process thinking about like well what um, you know, is, is there a, is there kind of a, a way to talk back to it? Is there a way to, to engage with quote unquote, the world at large in a way that feels like, um, like it, it, like you are in dialogue and that you're part of the culture because, because really, um, I try to convey to people like just sort of that as you change your own behavior, you, you give people around you permission to do the same. And that's how we, that's how we shape the culture, uh, politically same deal, you know, like, or just, um, whether that is writing letters or, or making phone calls or donating or whatever it is that's something that that allows people to tap into their agency and and for me there's just a lot of um, a lot of empathy that has been required this year and a, a lot of the fact that that just it seems like there is and there is more pain there's more pain emotionally than there has been in a while. And this is, you know, the studies are, are there to prove it more anxiety, more depression, more suicide, more substance abuse. And that the point of, of commonality with other people is that we're all experiencing this amorphous loss of the way that life used to be. And we're all experiencing a limitation on the outlets and and kind of like the things that we used to do to fill up the well, even if it was just like hugging our friends and you know just that simple basic things that we that we don't have as much access to, and so really being in a heart space, um, encouraging people to stay connected to each other and to in addition to themselves, but really um, it, getting the oxytocin going, things like self massage um, can can go a long way, um, setting up it, obviously being in contact with other human beings. And, and this is something that like I, I'm saying it as as I, I'm a practitioner prescribing it, but it's also been what I've been doing for myself is that, you know, making sure that I'm not just like on a zoom chat hanging out, you know, but that but that I'm really having um, heartfelt connections with people and considering like it, that one investment that I made uh, it was electric blankets for being able to sit outside with friends, you know, that oh, be, because thing. yeah, because it's like winter is coming here in Oregon and like, how are we going to get through it with, <laughs> with the darkness and not being able to go inside? So just thinking about like, what am I going to need in order to stay connected um, to it? Because we need each other. We need, we, we need the, 
the empathy and the sense of connectedness with other people in order to, I mean, loneliness being a, a risk factor in health that is as great as smoking. And so just especially thinking about like people who live alone or um, don't have necessarily a lot of social outlets, that a lot of that has been falling on practitioners, I think, to, to fill in the gaps in people's social lives and realizing that like, yeah, we also need a break from that. We need time out of being in a supporting role um, to, to be, I think, like lovingly numb, you know, like not necessarily just like checked out, but giving myself permission to do things that are, that are, I would consider like mindless, you know, at, at, because there's only so much, um, there's only so much of that holding space that one can do without needing to be a bit frivolous. And so just like letting there be, uh, letting there to be space for that as, uh, as an antidote to the heaviness in the world. Um, I just recently recorded a, a little intro on, on play um, just, and, and how like that's an underdeveloped skill for me um, is that a action that's just good for its own sake, that isn't necessarily put to a more purposeful use, but that just exists um, it, that just is for its own pleasure. And so um, really like for, for someone like me that has like had not turned my uh, light of awareness on that particular dimension of life very often, that took some, some introspection to even figure out like what does play even look like right now? And, um, and so still exploring that one, but, but making some progress. Yeah, play is not something <laughs> during the last six months I've seen a lot of either. I will playfully make up stupid songs throughout the day, um, but it is something to respect. And I think it'll be probably what gets us out of this. I, one of the things that biologists look at with play is that animals play a lot. And these are wild animals who don't meander. They go in straight lines. You know, incredibly efficient uh, predators and prey both engage in play. And it's one of the best ways, they believe, to help with problem solving and creativity and, uh, yeah, finding new solutions, which is definitely something that we're in need of right now. But then again, I mean, the idea with the electric blankets, that's, um, that's great. And maybe it can give birth to a new tradition. In China, old people are out playing chess. <laughs> it's freezing yeah. cold, but they're bundled up and have tea. Uh, why not? <laughs> There's a lot that can happen. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And and just getting getting back into pattern disruption. Like that's that's been the opportunity here is to disrupt the the sort of static patterned habitual ways that we have of of getting all sorts of needs met and just th thinking more creatively like that um really discerning what the need is and then being able to see what the strategies are to meet that need so yeah yeah and looking to other cultures that um it is is a great idea i think it, that i love the chess example and you know that yeah why not why not just get outside and do it differently Excellent. So you did uh, quite a few retreats before the COVID. And, yes. Um, <laughs> now, In the long, some, long ago. <laughs> yeah, there are some family members I have who I'm, are looking forward to COVID thawing out to, to do that with you. Yeah, hopefully someday. Again, I love bringing people together to again to play, to take safe risks, to um, to explore, to to move and breathe and and uh, meditate and chant and, and uh, map acupoints and look at, uh, look at ourselves and hopefully, uh, and, and being able to see ourselves through the lens of other people, right? I love bringing groups of people together, uh, just like herbs, right? Just that um, we don't find out what an herb does necessarily in isolation. We put it together with others and see what kind of personalities it draws out of these other herbs. And so mm. human beings are like that. We need to bounce around with each other in different contexts and, and letting different, different contexts uh, bring out different aspects of who we are right that that's that is part of of how we develop ourselves is by being around people who either you know if you want to develop your athleticism you go hang out with athletes or you know if you want to develop your ability to play you find people in your life who are good at that and spend time with them and um 
and see if, see if it can rub off because we are always influencing each other and being able to being able to gather and in an intentional way but that also is like um, an intentional recharge and that maybe lays the groundwork for for how we want to show up in the next phase of our evolution that's something that that I look forward to being able to do with people in person uh, mm-hmm. but also something that people can do um, anytime I have I have programs on changing habits I have you know and and love coaching on the personal development aspect as well yeah as you're listening to this Try to tap into how you're feeling. Is that something I really appreciate about Brody's work? Um, I look at those aspects kind of coming out within myself. And when I have family members, especially uh, very type A driven people, um, I refer them to see her because of that. So if you're listening and enjoy what you have heard so far. I'm sure you have definitely tune into a healthy curiosity. And if you are looking for um, one-on-one work, then definitely contact her. And where would the be the best place at a healthy curiosity.com or actually it's, it's all at Brody Welch.com. It's Brody okay. with an I E and Welch with a C H um, on, on my website, there is a page for the podcast, which is a healthy curiosity. It's available wherever you get your podcasts and uh, yeah, I'll, um, Brody Welch.com is, is the best way to get in touch. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciated learning from you even more. And I, I'm going to listen to this one a couple of times just to let it soak in a little bit. <laughs> it's really always fun to get to connect with you, Andrew, and a, a pleasure to be able to talk to your audience.